Uh, we're going to be spending a little bit of time this morning, um, you know, probably anywhere from like 30 to 40 minutes chatting about SIP trunking. Um, we prepared a kind of a quick little agenda for you. Um, we've opened it up so a lot of the folks um, are allowed to talk. Um, so we're going to try that out a little bit and also to um, any questions that come up during the webinar. If you want to post them into the uh, Q&A, um, we've got some moderators here that can kind of go through those questions for you as we're going along. And um, we're also going to allow for some Q&A time towards the end of the presentation. Um, so if you bear with me here, let me get my slide pointer here. All right, so as you can see, we got some um, kind of funny icons here up on the uh, desktop. And really what we're talking about is, um, you know, I, I, a lot of you probably joined up with the interest of uh, learning about SIP trunking. And maybe some of you are using SIP trunking today, or you're thinking about it, maybe you're using some old PRIs and some T1 circuits. Um, so we're going to go through some stuff uh, about those old PRI circuits, T1 circuits, and also, um, you know, some of the benefits of SIP and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, our agenda for the webinar, first we're going to chat a little bit about, um, you know, quick review of what is trunking, you know, why do we care about it, some of the limits that we have with legacy trunking, um, th there's quite a few of them, um, we're going to hit on some of the key ones kind of as it relates to SIP. Then we're going to chat a little bit about the evolution of SIP, um, it's, it's come a long way um, for those of you who maybe dabbled in it in the past, there was a period of time when it wasn't really ready for prime time. Um, so we're also going to then kind of roll over into the advantages of SIP trunking. After that, we're going to chat a little bit about SIP trunking and emergency call handling. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to save with SIP trunking. And at the end, we're going to go over some of the questions that came up in the Q&A. Um, so definitely any questions that you have as we're going through this or maybe something that we didn't talk about that you wanted to spend more time on, go ahead and post that in the Q&A and, um, you know, we, we're happy to go over a little bit if we have to, if those of you want to stay in case we need to. Um, real quick uh, about us at Intellic Solutions, um, you know, we were named to the Inc. 5000's 2019 list of fastest growing companies. We What we really do is we provide consulting services around, you know, designing, installing, testing, maintaining, supporting unified communication systems. And um, we offer real-time support around these things, uh, real-time monitoring, reporting, and we have a lot of engineers on staff who really understand um, how complex some of this stuff can get when we have, you know, multiple solutions from different vendors. Um, and, and we can also really understand how important that is to your business. Um, we specialize in, you know, some of the bullet points we have down there. Um, we're an Avaya partner. We're a Sangoma partner. And with those two vendors, we really focus around um, the SIP architecture, contact center, um, workforce optimization, call recording, uh, you know, next gen E911 solutions, as well as um, enterprise fax solutions. Because uh, believe it or not, faxing is still around. These are some of the customers we work with. Um, those of you um, may recognize some of these customers. We do all sorts of different things for these customers from, um, you know, taking care of their phone system, expanding the phone system, handling call recording, faxing, a lot of stuff to do with SIP, like multi-site SIP trunking, SIP failover. Uh, and a lot of these customers kind of come to us to design all that stuff for them and make it work. So without further ado, um, let's talk a little bit about trunking. Okay. You can see we've got our little uh, icon here and, and any of us who have worked in telecom for a while will know that, um, you know, an old telephone wall room when we see it. Um, trunks really why we care about them. It's how we connect our phone system to the outside world. If we didn't have trunks, we would really just have a big intercom system where we would have, you know, a thousand IP phones or digital phones, or whatever we have. We'd be able to call each other, maybe call other buildings on campus, but we'd never be able to call anybody outside the building and nobody would be able to call us. Normally in the US, what we have here is um, we have ISDN PRI circuits, um, which are really technically ISDN PRI is a protocol that they're delivered over T1 circuits, as you're probably familiar with. Um, 
and these circuits definitely have some limitations. Um, but the kind of the real gist here is that in order to make a phone call, right, we need a trunk. If we want to make a phone call outside of our phone system, we need a trunk and we need a channel on that trunk. So with our ISDN TDM PRI trunking, um, we, we have some limitations here. Okay. And um, <clears throat> after I go through some of the points in this slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce back and forth between this slide and um, if, if those are familiar with it, it's kind of like a live whiteboard. We're going to do a little bit of drawing um, to kind of explain some of these concepts. So if you see me bouncing back and forth between the presentation, that's, that's by design. So some of the big things we run into with limitations around this trunking, and again, it worked really well to get us this far, but scalability is a big issue. When we want to add capacity or sometimes even take away capacity, um, it, it, it can become very cumbersome. We need to add pieces of hardware to the phone system. We need to order circuits with our carrier. Um, you know, it could be AT&T, Verizon, Windstream, you know, Cox, Time Warner, whoever you're dealing with. We got to put it in an order for T1, get it dropped off and tested, get it integrated into the phone system, do some programming, and then we're essentially, you know, paying for capacity. Um, and usually in the U.S., it's going to be most commonly you're going to get the ability to make 23 extra calls for each T1 that you have. <clears throat> Excuse me. But with that, we bring into some certain points of failure, right? So when we have these T1 circuits, it requires a physical cable that goes from the carrier to your phone system. Whatever port we plug that into on in the phone system, we're now kind of, you know, I like to say married to that port. If something happens to that card in the phone system, um, you know, or that chassis that that card's sitting in, all, all of the call capacity on that T1 circuit is now lost. We no longer have it. Or we're going to lose all 23 channels if there's something that happens to that card. Um, and because of that, it requires a distributed architecture. So if you want to have, you know, the ability to make 200 calls, right, you're going to need nine T1 circuits that, and they, that can get expensive. We are also, when it comes to having like a multi-location presence, so if your company has offices in, in Boston, New York, California, Texas, Chicago, if you want to have local number presence in each one of those places, you're going to need some type of legacy trunk circuit at each one of those places. We can't really say, okay, you know what, give me 100 DIDs at each office, but send them down to my... ISDN PRI circuits in Boston. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, and then the other thing too is we, we see a lot of this now. We've been dealing with these carriers for a, a long time and just the evolution of the PSTN in general. A lot of carriers are moving away from PRI circuits. They don't want to support them anymore, um, especially like your traditional copper PRI circuits. So they're jacking up the cost of these things. They, they don't want to sign multi-year contracts on a lot of these services. Um, so they're almost kind of forcing people to go to SIP. Or what, what will happen is um, the carriers will essentially bring in an ethernet connection. They'll put a device on site and they'll hand you a PRI connection. So your phone system thinks that it's plugging into a T1 circuit. They'll bill you like you're using a PRI, but on the back end, it's really a SIP trunk. Um, and that brings into some, uh, that can potentially bring in some issues with like, you know, faxing and things like that if you're kind of depending upon that for having a PRI, uh, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you bear with me here, I'm going to flip over um, to a little live session here that I kind of want to chat about <clears throat> a couple of the things that we talked about with the TDM circuits. So if you kind of follow along with me here, We've got our smart jack over here on the left. And so when we want to add capacity, we order a circuit from our carrier. Okay. And that gives us the ability to make 24 calls, essentially, technically 23, if it's an ISDM PRI. Now with, with this circuit here, we can, these calls can be made. We can get an inbound call right from the outside into somebody at our phone system, or we can make an outbound call using one of these channels. 
Now, if we need to add capacity, I got to phone in the carrier and say, okay, you know what? Give me another circuit. Okay, now I get more capacity. So now I can do 48 calls, okay? Well, if my phone system here, let's say this guy can only support two T1 cards, but I'm, I'm still kind of short on capacity, right? So how I scale this up is I need to get more phone system real estate, then I need to order another circuit, right? Now let's say hypothetically I can make roughly technically 71 calls. Uh, I'm sorry, like I'm sorry, 69 calls I can make if these are all ISD and PRIs, which is great. I've increased my capacity for both inbound and outbound calls. My problem now is if anything happens, let's just say hypothetically one of these gateways has an issue that I have in my phone system. Let's say this one goes down. Now my capacity's dropped by like over 60%. I can no longer use these circuits here because they're physically plugged into that gateway. So now my users, I can only make 24 outbound calls or receive my 24 inbound calls, right? So that, that becomes a big problem here with the legacy circuits. If anything happens to this hardware, I, I can have an issue. So it's not really a logical architecture. It's definitely more of a physical architecture. And each one of these circuits can get really expensive. So depending upon who you have and, um, you know, to not to get into, you know, reading anybody's bills, but, you know, you can pay anywhere from, you know, $400 to, you know, we've seen customers paying well over a thousand dollars for one PRI, uh, depending upon how it has to get delivered and what the usage rates are on it and things like that. So, um, again, this is something where our scalability, I think is probably the biggest point we want to drive home is, is really one of the issues here. Okay, so I'm hey, Kenny, uh, just yeah. uh, we have a question uh, in the chat box. So William asked, uh, is AT&T IP Flex an example of SIP on their end, PRI on the customer side? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so some, some of these services like the AT&T IP Flex, um, there's another one with CenturyLink. Um, I think it's CenturyLink Voice Complete um, where they can kind of mix and match the services so they can give you um they can take your dids william and give them to you over sip and then also give you like a tertiary failover point via pri so what they can do is they can deliver you the same phone numbers over both sip and pri um and when we talk a little bit further in, in the presentation um, we can also get sip services delivered over a pri where um to, to William's point, what would happen here, and just bear with me, it's gonna do a little bit of erasing. We, we would actually have a SIP carrier bring in a SIP connection to your phone system, but in case your phone system can't handle it, what we would do is, this would be SIP. They'd put like a device on site that would be SIP on one side and PRI on the other. And the AT&T voice complete service, I'm pretty sure I can do that. And I was, um, I'm sorry, the AT&T IP flex. Um, th I'm sure just about any SIP trunk carrier can do that as well as like CenturyLink, they can do the same thing. Uh, that's a good question. All right, let me roll back here. I'm gonna flip back over to our presentation. Uh, and I just kind of want to review some terminology here. And we're going to go, we're going to take a quick look at this slide. Then I'm going to bounce right back over to our um, little whiteboard session here to kind of review where these terms fit in. Okay, so on a SIP, SIP trunk, um, really kind of how it differs in some ways, it's still the principle for every call we want to make. And when I say call, I'm talking about an inbound or an outbound call a call that's gonna leave the phone system or come into the phone system. We need a channel on a PRI or a T1, or we need a session with the SIP carrier. Most SIP carriers are gonna bill you per SIP session. And a SIP session, if you have one SIP session on your SIP trunk, that means you can carry one call. Um, a SIP session manager, now again, I know we do a lot with Avaya and Sangoma, which is your asterisk based PBXs. 
there's, you know, there's Cisco, there's Mitel, there's Shortel. Different folks have a different way of implementing SIP. Um, when we say a SIP session manager, really what we're talking about is something that, and, and we'll show this on the next slide, is, is a way for you to kind of control the routing a little bit better. Um, an SBC, really think about that like a TDM firewall. I would never tell anybody to put in a SIP trunk without a session border controller. Uh, it gives you a secure edge. It gives you a way to mitigate any security risks. Um, it gives you a great spot for testing. It, it almost acts as like your demarcation point. It's kind of like your own smart jack if you were to compare a SIP trunk to a T1. <clears throat> a DID number, um, it, we're going to talk about this a little bit. It, it's exactly what it is. It's a direct inward dial number, meaning it's the number on like your business card or your email signature or your published number for your company. It's a number that folks can reach you from the outside. Quality of service, quality of service, really what that is, those are configurations on routers and firewalls that prioritize certain types of packets based upon certain markings. Um, that becomes important when we talk about doing SIP trunks over our internet connections. And we already talked a little bit about ISD and PRI, which is really a legacy phone system circuit. And the fact that it's a PRI means that it can technically only carry 23 simultaneous calls. We use the 24th channel for signaling. So we bounce back over here. In our terminology, our SBC would kind of sit right over here. Uh, this little blue box in the top right. And what that SBC does is it gives me a secure connection between my phone system, which is right here, right? This is, we'll, we'll say this is our PBX. And this is our SIP carrier over here. We got, we got our connection and we got our SIP carrier. So let's just say, um, let's say this is AT&T. Okay. And we're doing this over, they may give us like an MPLS connection, something like that. And this is our firewall. So this little kind of demarcation point here would be anything over here would be our site. And anything to the left is the carrier. Okay, so kind of referring to our terminology here, um, our quality of service stuff would be anything we would do right here to make sure that the voice packets we send out to the carrier and stuff we receive in doesn't get all jumbled up with anything else we may be using this connection for. Right, so a lot of times, um, a lot of customers, especially early on with SIP, would purchase SIP from AT&T, for example, and AT&T would say, hey, we'll, we'll not only sell you the SIP, we'll sell you an MPLS connection. Um, and we'll give you, you know, 50 meg on that connection and we'll say 10 meg of that is for voice. So to make sure that we comply with that, we wanna make sure that we have our QoS marking set up correctly over here in our firewall. Um, our SBC, which sits right here, this really hides all of our PBX IP addresses. So remember, those of you who may be PBX administrators, you may have a hundred different gateways. Maybe you have 5,000 IP phones, right? The inbound and outbound calls we make from the phone system, we really, thanks to the SBC, when we make these calls in and out, we only represent one IP address, right? And that's either gonna be your SBC's IP address or it can be your firewall's IP address, depending upon your particular configuration. So it kind of, hides, it's called topology hiding, all the stuff we have going on down here gets hidden by the SPC. Okay. So, and when we talked about the channel concept of the SIP session, your SIP carrier here, in our case AT&T, let's say they may sell you a 100 session, and I'm, I'm drawing this with my finger here, so forgive me if it looks a little herky-jerky, they may sell you a 100 session SIP trunk. That's great. So you're going to be limited to make 100 calls, or you're limited to receive 100 calls, 
or maybe you're receiving 55 calls and you make 45 calls, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna be 100 sessions total, whether those are in or outbound. And, and for SIP here, we're talking about voice sessions. All right. So I am going to bounce back here over on the left-hand side and go back to our presentation. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about SIP trunking evolution. Um, for those of you who have maybe been working with this technology for a while, um, <clears throat> SIP trunking really the, in the late 2000s is when we started seeing a lot of um, early early adopters were, were kind of out there from a carrier perspective and also from, you know, customer perspective, people wanting to take advantage of SIP trunking and the benefits, you know, even realizing it back then. Um, the challenge we ran into, and, and I was part of a lot of um, early, you know, in, the, in even from like 2000, like six to 2009, a lot of really interesting cutovers to SIP trunking. Um, the offerings that we had from the carriers were kind of all over the place. Um, and, and how the carriers kind of chose to implement features, even simple things like getting calling party number to work, or um, God forbid you tried to do like some type of twinning. Um, you, you know, you're bouncing a call out to your cell phone and you need to represent different calling party numbers. It was, it was really difficult to get things working because everybody kind of had, you know, um, different interpretations of standards, things like that. When you try to get different vendors, you know, using the same protocol, actually working together, I think things can get pretty difficult. Um, it reminded me a lot of, uh, you know, for anybody who was around um, when we first started rolling out ISDN to carry voice calls um, from straight T1s, similar function. It was just one of those things. It was just a little early and, and you knew it was going to get better, but it was definitely a little, little rocky at the beginning. Um, fast forward a little bit from like 2010 to today, SIP trunking is all over the place. Uh, your major carriers and you know I say that your major voice carriers who are, who are you know legacy heritage voice carriers that are still around today they all have SIP trunking offers um, they can deliver these to you in a couple of different ways so they're either provided by you know a dedicated connection like we talked about on our previous drawing right where you had somebody giving you an MPLS connection and we carved out a little bit of that for voice or, and we're seeing this a lot now, customers are just happy using their internet connections. Um, you know, the internet has changed a lot in the past 10 years in terms of reliability and what people are willing to put over the internet, you know, especially with the adoption of, you know, cloud services and everyone's using Google or Office 365 and people are very comfortable putting their, you know, eggs in the basket of cloud services reachable over internet connections. Um, we see a lot of customers saying, hey, I don't wanna pay, you know, 300, 1,000 or 3,000 dollars for a recurring monthly connection to CenturyLink or to, to Verizon, I'd rather just use my existing internet connection. Can I do that? And, and the answer is, yeah, you absolutely can. Um, and one of the bullets here that, that's kind of made this really possible is a lot of the phone system vendors now we've seen, they're really going all in on supporting SIP. You know, from, from SIP phones to SIP trunks to, to SIP in and down the protocol stack of the actual phone system application. Um, and that wasn't always the case previously. Previously, SIP was kind of like a bolt on or an add on, requires a lot of configuration expertise to get it working. Now, even your simplest phone systems, like if you take um, like an Asterix PBX, it was meant to support SIP trunking. So it makes it very easy to get things going. Um, last bullet point to talk about a little right hand side is uh, faxing. So when people talk about SIP trunking, one of the things that comes up is maybe uh, a negative against SIP trunking is, hey, it doesn't work that well with faxing. Uh, and there is some truth to that. Um, any IP technology with f like modems or, or faxes, they really weren't meant to work together. Um, so some carriers will support what's called T38 um, with like a G711 fallback. So when I say T38 or G711, really what I'm talking about there is when we establish a SIP call over a SIP trunk, we part of SIP's job is to negotiate the properties of the session. So when you make an outbound call from an IP phone on your desk, you're probably going to negotiate with a SIP carrier to use a codec like G711 or G729. If a fax machine tries doing that, and the, and the system that the fax machine is making the call from can support T.38, 
and the carrier supports T.38, then we want them to try to negotiate to use that protocol because that protocol was meant to send faxes over an IP connection. Um, the challenge you're going to have is, and this is something where, you, you know, hopefully, you know, working with somebody like us, we can kind of educate you on a little bit is if faxing is a big part of your business, we re and you're looking to choose a SIP trunk provider or evaluate them, uh, we really want to put to the forefront the ones that will support T38 with a G711 fallback because, like I said, it's not very common that people even support that. So definitely something to take into consideration. Um, one other thing I'll note here is in, in some of you who are like iPhone users or um, on different networks as 5G becomes more available, you may notice an uptick in audio quality when you call other people on iPhones, maybe on AT&T or Verizon's network, and you may say, wow, this call sounds really good. Um, what happens is, is that they're able to kind of handle the end-to-end -end negotiation for you on that type of call um, and use a better codec like G722 or a wideband codec so it maybe sounds even like a um, like a radio broadcast. We can do that on the phone systems too and on, on the session border controllers on the SIP trunks. We can offer codecs like G722 which sound amazing. The challenge we run into is if, if we go all in with those codecs when you call somebody who's on an older phone system or um, maybe you call into a business that can't support G722, we always have to leave like G711 in there as a fallback. So we have something to fail back to um, just for interoperability reasons. So one thing I want to talk a little bit about here now, and we're going to jump over to uh, one of our little drawing sessions in a second, is the benefits of SIP trunking. Some of you may know a lot of these already, but just to kind of hit on some of the big ones and the real decision makers that when people say, listen, you know what, I'm fed up with all these T1s I'm paying for. I want to, you know, roll up my sleeves and, and go over to SIP and, and go through a project to do that. These are the big reasons why we see people doing it. Um, one of the big ones is the number flexibility. Okay. So let's say we have a, a SIP trunk and, and I'll draw this out a little bit um, when we go back to the drawings, but let's say we have a SIP trunk in Boston, right? And you've got an office in California, like out in LA or San Francisco. And you got to, you want to put a hundred people at that office and you want to give those people LA numbers. That's very easy with SIP trunking. We can just get a hundred numbers in LA or whatever area code it is you need and port them over to your Boston SIP trunk. Um, since SIP's more of a logical service, you know, it really depends upon the carrier sometimes. Um, you know, some carriers can even get you numbers in Canada. Some carriers are international, um, may require a secondary session border controller, maybe in like the UK or something like that to access those numbers. But um, we can open up a big avenue of, of flexibility for you when it comes to obtaining phone numbers for different areas. Um, bullet number two is the scalability of it. So when we talk about a SIP trunk, you know, we're talking about it's really a configuration profile that you would have with a carrier. So let's say you have a SIP trunk with Verizon and they say, okay, you know what, you have 50 channels. Okay, great. We configure your session border controller and we can configure your phone system. If you want to go from 50 to 75 channels, it's very easy to just ask Verizon for 25 more channels. Um, we don't need to install anything. We don't really need to touch the phone system, right? We can kind of future-proof the configuration so you know we can say the phone system can handle a thousand calls but maybe you're only paying Verizon for 50 you know if you if you order 50 more channels you just do that and then now all of a sudden you've doubled your calling capacity by you know placing an order online um, we don't need to visit the phone system we don't need to log in we don't need to do anything at all that that's a big one um, a third one is and especially we're, we're, we're getting a lot of requests for this with everything that's been happening um, with, with the virus and everything like that, and people looking at, you know, folks working from home, um, business continuity options, um, is we can really get creative on how we handle failover. So we can, with SIP trunking, we can fail over automatically your inbound and your outbound calls between, you know, multiple data centers, and it's really, you know, set it and forget it type failover. So when we, when we configure it, you know, during the project phase of it, 
we do all the routing and then we just leave it alone. And then what happens is the SIP carrier will, um, you know, be sending all your calls to data center number A, yeah, the data center A. And if data center A goes offline for whatever reason, they automatically send the next call to data center B. Nobody knows, we, you know, you may get some alarms or some alerts or something like that. Maybe something's going on at data center A. But the, the beauty of it is you're still processing calls. You're still, you know, that published number you have on your website that you're getting thousands of calls an hour into, you didn't miss a call. The calls just rolled right over to data center B. And same for the outbound. We can control the outbound the same way. Um, some, some carriers will have the ability to fail to back over to a PRI as a third failover point in case both of your SIP trunks are down. Those are things we definitely cannot do on TDM trunking. Um, the fourth one, and, and this depends upon the type of business you're in and, and how your architecture is, but and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in this in the webinar here, but a centralized architecture. So what this really means for us is that we can have kind of a centralized dial plan where we take in the numbers that come in from our SIP carrier and we can send them anywhere we want to. Um, and we can kind of have a centralized dial plan to do that. So we can send them to multiple sites, to, to multiple different phone systems, right? Um, the beauty of the SIP trunking is, is that, you know, a lot of times when we're talking SIP trunking, we're talking a SIP carrier, talking to one phone system. Another way we can use it is, let's just say you've got, you know, your one main phone system and then you've, you know, you do manufacturing or retail and you've got smaller phone systems dispersed throughout the US. We can still centralize all those numbers for you and take in all your DIDs over a SIP trunk and then distribute them, you know, over your network down to those other phone systems, whatever they are, and save a lot of money. Um, instead of having like legacy trunks at every single one of those remote sites. Okay. And the last one, we chatted about this a little bit on the previous slide, is the deployment options. We have some flexibility. <clears throat> so, you know, if, if you have special requirements, um, albeit maybe security requirements, or maybe you already have an existing connection with a carrier and it's cheaper for you to utilize their connection, we can use an MPLS connection or a connection right into a, with their data center or we can use your internet connection um, to deliver the SIP trunkings, the tr trunking services. So I think that's, those are really, really um, compelling reasons to think about SIP trunking. And again, most of those are things that we can't even imagine doing with legacy TDM trunking. Um, so if you bear with me here, I'm just gonna flip over real quick and kind of go through some of these um, options and kind of what they look like. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the number portability, kind of what really what that looks like is, let's say we've got, you know, two sites, right? So let's say we've got, um, uh, we've got our Massachusetts location up here, and we've got a California location down here. And what we want is maybe we want to have some 925 numbers, some DIDs, we want to purchase them for our users down in California but we only have our one SIP trunk up here in Boston. No problem, we can just purchase those numbers and the carrier will send them to your SIP trunk in Boston, right? And they'll come down to your phone system and they'll route down to the users in California. And we can rinse and repeat this effort for just about any state in the United States. Um, you, you will run into some weird exceptions, especially in smaller, more rural areas where it's like, a, it can become a little bit more of a challenge to get numbers ported over. Um, it's not it's not impossible and you can't do it, but you might have to go through like a couple of paperwork transactions to get it done. Um, again, this is something where in the past on a, on, a, on a legacy circuit, if you wanted these numbers, kind of what we'd have to do is we would have to, order you a, a T1, right? And you'd have to have that number pointed to that T1. This T1's in California, and we'd send that call to the California users. That's how we'd have to do that in the past. Now you're paying for a, another T1, more usage fees, things like that. In reality, we just wanna be able to utilize your SIP trunk. 
Um, another thing I wanted to chat about here a little bit is when we talk about failover, okay? So this is really where this be can become kind of fun and interesting um, from an architecture perspective and really kind of make it so you can really endure just about anything that happens in your data centers is we can have a secondary, let's just say hypothetically, get my drawing thing here. So normally let's say your SIP trunk carrier is gonna deliver all your calls to data center A, right? And then th these calls come into your phone system, everything's going okay, but now all of a sudden, we're having an issue, maybe it's the session border controller that's having an issue, or maybe that internet connection or the data center's having an issue. If something's going on, your SIP trunk provider can't deliver you those calls anymore. And they do that by detecting maybe some type of SIP response code, some type of timeout, the carrier is gonna kick it in and say, okay, you know what? I can't get there anymore. Let me try route B. So we send that call over here. Same phone numbers. We've replicated your configuration. We've got an SBC down here. And now we can shoot calls down to Massachusetts or to California, whatever the case may be. The beauty is you didn't have to do anything. It's all in the configuration. So the SIP trunk provider was able to detect the outage and then they start sending the calls down to data center B. And it works the same on the outbound as well too. So we can essentially, if we're trying to send our calls out, data center A, and all of a sudden we run into an issue. And let's say data center A is totally offline for whatever reason the phone system is smart enough to just reissue that call down here and we send that call out. And the beauty is the, the phone system users, they won't even understand or realize that their call is being reissued out of secondary trunk. It All they know is that things just seem to work. Uh, one, so let me, um, transition back over to our slide here. One of the things I wanna talk about, and you may be wondering about a little bit is, um, and this is a big one, E911 emergency call alerting. So with our legacy circuits, this was really easy to do because like the billing address or your service address, wherever that circuit was installed, that would be the address that was sent out to the public your public safety answering point your, or your PSAP. So basically, the, the, that's who's gonna take that 911 call. They're gonna get a, you know, a screen pop, essentially, with the origination address of who made that emergency call. On your TDM circuits, again, that's your billing address. It's reliable, it works well, but it, it has its limitations. With SIP, we can get a lot more flexible. Um, we have what's called an ELIN, okay, which is your emergency location identification number. And think about that as really just kind of a profile that the SIP trunk carriers have. Um, they'll charge you for these, you know, it can be anywhere from a dollar to a few dollars a month. Um, and we can have as many as you have phone numbers, right? And the, usually how this works is each ELIN that you have will be tied to one DID or multiple DIDs. And what happens is, is when somebody at your phone system makes an emergency call over a SIP trunk, that SIP trunk number, the calling party number, is tied in with one of these ELINs. So let's just say somebody at your main office where you've got 5,000 users, maybe you have 5,000 DIDs, you could potentially get away with having one ELIN profile or, or maybe a few if you have different buildings. And the information in that ELIN is what's going to get passed to the public safety answering point. Uh, when somebody makes an emergency phone call. This makes it kind of handy too, because if we have like remote users, or if you, we went back to our scenario of a SIP trunk in Boston, right, but you have users in California, we can just get an ELIN for California and tie all those California DIDs to that ELIN. So if somebody from California were to make an emergency phone call, it would actually help send to the PSAP, you know, not only the right number for California, but it would also send it to the right PSAP. Okay. So um, just bear with me, I'm gonna jump back over to uh, 
some drawing time, kind of to show you how this works. So um, if somebody, you know, from our PBX over here makes an emergency phone call, let's just say they, you know, we're going to send out, we're going to make our phone call here and it's a 911 call, it's an emergency call. What the SIP trunk provider is going to really care about um, without getting into any next gen stuff, they're going to take, take a look at your calling party number. And or it'll be like our SIP from header, um, they're going to really care about that. And they're going to tie that to an ELIN profile. So that ELIN info is what's going to be sent over here. So this is where SIP's great because if, if our if our phone system is supporting multiple states or remote users, or if you have work from home users, um, we can get different ELINs for, for all those different locations that we have. So depending upon wherever that emergency call originates from, right? So, you know, if, if we have somebody in, um, you know, Texas and they make an emergency call, so they're a user of our phone system, they make an emergency call, okay, comes down here. All right, maybe they're over in Austin, right? So their calling party number might be something different. So that's going to be their calling party number from Texas. Well, we have an ELIN for that. So that data will be passed correctly also to the correct PSAP showing the correct information for that person who's in Austin, but they're still off of our Boston phone system. In the past, what we would have to do in order to make this work, we would have had to purchase a T1 or an analog line, like a 1MB line, depending upon how much capacity we needed down in Texas. So when somebody made an emergency call, we'd have to configure the phone system to send those emergency calls out that T1 over to our PSAP. So now we're paying money for this T1 for maybe something that's, you know, we all agree that 911 is important, but you know, usually we don't have too, too many 911 calls per year. Um, if we can utilize a, the SIP trunking features to do this, it's a much more cost-effective way to do it. And then um, I'm gonna bounce back over here to the presentation and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, cost savings with SIP trunking. And this is just, we, we've done quite a few of these subtrunking cutovers with different customers of, you know, in different verticals, different sizes, you know, from a few hundred users to, to tens of thousands of users. Um, they all have different reasons for doing it. Some of them, uh, a lot of similarities like we talked about earlier with the decentralization, the number flexibility, the business continuity. Um, but like with most companies, any company, um, it, a lot of it's driven by cost savings, right? How, how much money can we save by doing this? Um, the one I'll talk about right now, real quick, before we get into the Q&A, is um, we had a customer we were working with, um, large retail customer, and they had, you know, over 80 locations, right? Each one of these locations was its own phone system. Each one of those phone systems had four analog lines at each location. And what that meant was, you know, they were paying for analog lines at each one of these locations, um, you know, depending could be anywhere from 30 to 40 even more sometimes per line times four times 80 right because you get 80 stores and that would just give you a one month bill okay um and we're going to send out the i think steve might have put it in the chat but we're going to send out a link to this the slides here so you can download the case study and, and also have the presentation um after this um but so let me jump back over here to our drawing if you bear with me here and, and talk about this customer in particular for a second. Um, so what, what they had was each one of these stores previously had analog lines. And their published number for the store would route down to these analog lines and ring the phones at the store. So they were paying over, you know, I, I, I think it was probably, let's say it's, you know, over $150,000 per year. If we added up the, you know, for the four analog lines times 80 stores, 
it was really expensive and, and it was very time consuming too. Well, these analog trunks in some of these legacy facilities, they can be a little sensitive, like to weather, um, to all sorts of things. Like, you know, somebody pulls a wire, um, numbers go out, you know, lines go down, things aren't ringing, they're at half capacity. So they were also spending a lot of hours um, care and feeding a lot of these analog lines, you know, um, four analog lines, 80 stores, 320 lines, plenty of tickets in about these things. So coordinating vendor meets, all that sort of stuff. Um, so there's a hidden savings kind of in not having to deal with that. So um, they came to us because their corporate phone system was already on SIP trunking that we had done for them. We said, hey, look, you know what? Why don't we take these stores, port those stores phone numbers over to SIP and then route those calls down to the store? Um, essentially, and, you know, that way we can handle your, your inbound, which is with most of their traffic. Um, but we'd also potentially route the outbound calls that way too. So essentially what we did here was we hooked these, the store's phone systems. In their case, um, we, we locked out because they were um, systems that were capable of speaking SIP. But even if they weren't, there were things we could have done to, to make it work. Uh, but what we were able to do is we hooked all of these store phone systems into our centralized SIP server. Up here we have their, this was their corporate phone system, which is also hooked into the same SIP server. And in blue over here on the right, we've got our SBC and we've got our SIP trunk carrier. So what we did was we took, you know, one of their stores, let's say, you know, 978, 555 1000 was one of their store numbers. So instead of having that ported down to the store over an analog trunk, we ported that number to the SIP trunk carrier, who sends it to our SBC, who sends it on down to the store. And what we're able to do is we said, okay, we can just adapt that. So it rings at the, cur at the courtesy desk, which is extension 1000. But then to, to make it so it works the other way, we said, okay, when this store makes an outbound call, right, we need the outside world to see what number. We needed to see this number. So using the, you know, the, our SIP router here in our case, which it was an Avaya session manager, um, it's a product we like a lot, but there's other products that will do something similar. We were able to manipulate this number so when this store, let's say it was, you know, store number one, made an outbound phone call. If they called you on your cell phone, you would see this number. So you could call that number back. And if you called that number back, it would come in, ring down to that store and so on. Um, so we were able to kind of really just go through, you know, we, we did all our configurations here. We went through some porting efforts with uh, the carrier, uh, the losing carrier happened to be Verizon. And now the customer, is really they up their SIP trunk capacity by about you know 30 channels or so um, because they already had a little too much capacity to be begin with on the SIP trunk that they weren't using for the corporate office up here and we were able to cancel you know 320 analog lines so the customer saved you know over like hundred twenty thousand dollars a year and this architecture here is much more reliable like we can get in we can trace we can troubleshoot um, we don't have tickets with Verizon anymore for analog lines going down when there's a thunderstorm, that sort of thing. Um, so this is just one example of how we can really take um, the flexibility that we have with SIP trunking and, you know, potentially save a lot of money. So I think what we have left is a little bit of time for Q&A. So I don't know, Steve, if we've had any more questions come in the chat or if anybody wants to go ahead and ask any questions now towards the end here. Um, just to be respectful of everybody's time. All right. Yeah, I'm just looking over this Q and A now, Steve. I can see that we had, you had a couple of questions here. Uh, William had, but it looks like you got those ones answered. Uh, 
Um, William had a question here in the in the chat in the Q and A. Um, what's the average ROI time um, for us? I'm just going off the couple of examples we've had. Um, the, the example I was just talking about. Um, I think they saw an ROI in that one in about three to four months, William, um, because we were able to cancel so many lines um, so quickly. Um, obviously, every case is going to be a little bit unique in terms of, um, you know, how many circuits we're displacing versus, um, you know, whether you have a SIP trunk already or you need to start from scratch and, and buy a SIP trunk and um, whatever licenses you may need or may not need on the phone system side. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something we can definitely run run for you, uh, depending upon what you're dealing with. Um, let's see. It looks like we have another one. Okay, let me check that one out. It says, can you speak to next gen 911 service for North America? And I don't know if whoever wrote that, if, if there's something in particular um, that you want us to elaborate um, that one. So as you're doing that, the anonymous attendee who wrote that question, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, there's a couple of federal laws uh, passed, um, the Ray Baum Act and Carey's Law. Uh, Carey's Law went into effect this year, uh, which requires on-site notification. And the Ray Baum Act actually requires Okay, perfect. That's what you were getting at. And the Ray Bomb Act requires the location to be sent to the PSAP. So we actually partner, you know, with a few different vendors. Um, so that's something um, we actually did a webinar on this, I uh, think last month. So if you want to um, write to us, um, when we send out the, the post, the recording, we can send you a copy of that webinar we did. And I think that would probably answer a lot of your questions. And then, you know, like always, you know, we'd have to understand your situation, uh, you know, what you're looking to do uh, to see uh, how we can best help you. So th there's a lot to those two things, the Ray Bomb Act and CARES Law. So we would definitely want to get with you uh, offhand uh, to kind of go through your options. But as Kenny mentioned, uh, the notifications being sent through SIP trunking can be a big cost saving uh, and give you different options in order to become compliant with that, uh, with those laws. Via crisis alert. Okay, I see uh, William's question there. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> in our experience, William, it, it, it doesn't for a couple of reasons. Um, it in, in terms of carries law, it looks like we need an on-screen notification um, that's like on, on a desktop or via email, uh, whereas the crisis alert is just um, on the display of the phone. And also, the bigger thing is the logging of that occurrence. So part of like carries law is have to be like a, a log of those emergency calls. And with the crisis alert, um, it doesn't, the PBX won't log those calls forever in the PBX or on the phone, um, especially if you have like a dual servers, uh, dual communication manager servers and they interchange um, that those emergency call notifications aren't passed between the two servers when they interchange. So unless um, you're using some other third party system that tracks those calls and collects those from the, from your Avaya system, um, it wouldn't really meet the requirements of carries law by just using crisis alert alone. Um, got another question here. Um, the question is, what type of SBCs do we work with? Uh, and I, I can respond to that in chat, but the SBCs we normally work with are the Avaya SBC, the Sangoma SBC, and also the uh, Audio Codes SBC. Those are the three SBCs that we primarily work with. Um, we've worked with the Oracle Acme Packet in the past. Um, we haven't really work with that one in a little while. All right, let's see. 
So we're coming up on, we've got two minutes till 11.30. Um, so just be respectful of anybody's time. If anybody has any questions at all, just throw them into the Q&A. Uh, we'll hang in here for a few minutes afterwards. Um, but if not, I mean, that was the, the just the presentation and the webinar. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining. I really appreciate your time. I know everybody's really busy. Um, like I said, I'll, I'm going to hang in here with Steve a little bit, answering anything we, that might pop up in the Q&A. But um, again, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And just a reminder, there was a question asked earlier. Uh, once the recording's done, we will be sending uh, the recording and a copy of the presentations out to all those who registered. Um, and then certainly, uh, once you receive that, if you have any follow-up uh, questions, uh, we can schedule a meeting and, and see where we can help you. Thank you.